The vast expanse of Nevada's badlands stretches endlessly to the horizon. Hidden within these mountain strongholds are some of America's deepest and darkest secrets. Secret aircraft and the other legends of Area 51. Among these sandstone canyons today, there's a new glimmer of truth. Shrouded in mystery, it's a story that demands to be told. These are the witnesses of one of America's most unusual UFO encounters in history. Navy veterans and a band of brothers that want you to know that what they witnessed is real. This is their story. Petty Officer Jason Turner served aboard the USS Princeton in 2004. His personal conviction for democracy and patriotism guides him in his search for the truth. This is an actual event that happened and I witnessed it. Aviation tech Patrick Hughes, a USS Nimitz veteran, he speaks for his shipmates who choose to remain silent. I, I'm one of those who has to see to believe. Um, and obviously, I've seen the evidence of this, so it exists. Top Gun Air Intercept Controller Kevin Day and Fire Controlman Gary Voorhees, both from the Princeton, served together in the ship's Combat Information Center. They saw them first, whatever it is they are. They wanted to show themselves whatever they were. I don't think they wanted anything really to do with us. They were literally breaking the laws of physics in my eyes. These sailors are here for truth and vindication, and their story goes back over a decade to a time and place that marked a departure for all of them, both in their Navy careers, but also in their knowledge of the limits of man's technological understanding of our world. Looking out over the ocean toward the horizon, sun, sea, and sky form an endless vista, a never-ending cycle of tide, wind, and waves. Here, far from shore, strange events have unfolded. These stories stretch the boundaries of our imagination and challenge our beliefs. This is a true story of such events from the accounts of the sailors and naval aviators who experienced them. Professional military service members who want the world to know that what they encountered is real. Even more troubling, our military has no explanation. The answers seem to elude everyone, like reflections on the waves. Yet, they are out there. November 10th, 2004. 90 miles southwest of San Diego, California, in the Naval Operations Area, the Nimitz Carrier Strike Group and her complement of warships and the aircraft of Air Wing 11 are conducting a routine two-week training exercise. Nearby, the guided missile cruiser USS Princeton has been tracking unknown aircraft that appear and disappear from her sophisticated Aegis radar screens. The Spy-1 Bravo radar is one of the most advanced sensors ever deployed. Princeton's main role is air defense of the strike group, and Operation Specialist Senior Chief Day is in charge of protecting the airspace around the Nimitz. And my job was to man the radars and ID everything that flew in the skies. And I also um, sat a position called Anti-Air Warfare Coordinator, where if we ever had to go to war, I was the guy that was going to launch the missiles and kill shit. Um, in addition to that, I was an air intercept controller. When the Super Hornets take off the carrier, I'm the guy that takes control and takes them to the fight and gets them home safe. And there was a lot of experience in that room. The captain had 28 years, I had 18 years. And the Aegis ship is um, our newest uh, weapon system afloat. It's got the Spy-1 radar system, uh, phased array radar system, and I was an, an expert on that. 
Inside the Combat Information Center, Chief Day's attention is focused on a group of unknown aircraft on the Spy-1 screen. He's trying to identify them. I was on watch, and we were probably 100 miles, I forget how far exactly that day we were, off the coast of San Diego Southwest, um, kind of off the coast of Mexico Baja. And I started to notice um, these weird tracks that were popping under my ra radar coverage right about on San Clemente Island. And the reason why I say they were weird, because they were appearing in groups of five to 10 at a time, and they were pretty closely spaced to each other. And they were 28,000 feet going 100 knots tracking south. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of odd. I mean, what? I don't know anything that flies like that. They weren't on the Com Air routes, the commercial air airline routes. Um, I wasn't really that concerned about them. I didn't consider them hostile for any, any reason at all. Another watch or two, as I'm watching the same formation appeared again. And over the course of uh, three, four days, it probably counted up to that point, um, groups of five to 10 at a time. There were probably 50, 60 tracks by then. Today, Kevin and Gary are still looking for answers. They've known each other for over a decade since their Navy days. Gary was a third-class petty officer and fire controlman back then. I worked on the Aegis computer system uh, on a CG-59 uh, guided missile cruiser, the USS Princeton. I'm in charge of uh, CC and uh, data recording and maintaining and operating all the mainframes that run the system. They're both becoming increasingly frustrated in their attempts to ID the strange aerial objects, which have no transponders and fit no known flight profiles. The guys that work on the Spy-1 Bravo radar, they, they had come across and said they needed to take the system down for recalibration because they were getting uh, clutter uh, or ghost tracks and they needed to recalibrate to get rid of them. Then once they did finish all that recalibration, bring it back up, uh, the tracks didn't disappear. Uh, they were still there, but they were actually sharper and clearer. They were doing a diagnostic tests on everything we had to make sure it was not a system malfunction. And it turned out that it wasn't. These were actually real objects. Um, I had the, spy, the highest spy track quality possible on these, co on these contacts. In this situation, I actually started recording on all four tapes at the same time. That way, it was a one continuous loop, and I was just replacing them as they were you know, becoming full. We failed utterly to identify these things. It, it, it didn't um, meet any of the parameters for anything that was known. In some cases, they seemed to descend from space and then suddenly plunge to near sea level in seconds. Coupled with the unidentified nature of the craft and lack of clearance, these extreme flight observations are very troubling to the crew assigned to protect the carrier group from aerial threats. Sunday, November 14th, morning. The Nimitz deck crew is busy launching FA-18F Super Hornets, helicopters, and E-2 Hawkeye early warning planes. The mission? Simulated air defense or ADAX training over the Pacific. The winds are calm, the skies are clear, a near perfect day for flying. As they launch, the Black Aces Squadron has no knowledge of events happening nearby. In the back of my mind, that's when I determined I was going to become concerned about these objects is we were getting ready to launch a whole bunch of aircraft in that same piece of sky. Fast Eagle climbs out to 20,000 feet and heads to the cap station about 40 miles south of the carrier. The cap is a rendezvous point used to form up with the other airplanes. Just 25 miles separation. The commander of Fast Eagle has over a decade in the air wing. His wingman for the day is a new pilot, a young officer on her first carrier deployment. She's paired with a senior pilot her backseat weapons system officer for the mission. He will manage navigation and the advanced radar and targeting pods on the aircraft. Overhead, an E-2 Hawkeye from the Wall Banger Squadron is on station directing the aircraft. Banger provides eye-in-the-sky command and control during carrier flight operations. Back in the Combat Information Center on Princeton, the mysterious objects are back. 
and today is the first time Senior Chief Day has jets in the air that can intercept the mysterious aircraft. Seeing these contacts, um, Captain Smith orders me to intercept one of them, so I just, I, I went back to the console, I picked the closest one that was to us, and I was gonna, I would, had intended to let the Hawkeye do the intercept, because they already had control, it was just easier. Day briefs the captain, and they agree to send the Hornets. The air intercept controller aboard Princeton, call sign Charlie, radios the Hawkeye and takes control of Fast Eagle. Banger, Charlie. Charlie, so banger, go ahead. Banger, Charlie, do you hold unknown air contact? Bra 270 48, 28,000 feet, of bogey. Charlie Banger, negative. Radar picture's clean. The E-2 radar operators have been frustrated in their attempts to get a radar return on the unknown aerial target that Princeton is tracking. Even with their 24-foot radar dish, they can't get a lock on the object. Banger, Charlie. Transfer fast eagle flight to Charlie Control, button 1-3. We have a real-world task for them. Charlie, Banger, Roger. Fast eagle, Charlie. Stand by for real world tasking. Charlie Fast Eagle, send it. We vector him towards that position in the sky and real quiet on the radio. We're, I'm just giving him um, bra calls, which is bearing range altitude, to these unknown bogey group. And basically, I'm just telling the, their crew where the object is, the, the bearing from them, and the range from them, and the altitude so they can drive towards it. Contact bra 27041. 20,000 feet, bogey, snap, 270, over. Roger, bearing 270, 41 miles. 100, zero, go trail. 100, zero, zero. stay, stay. Stay 12,000 pounds. Clean, do you have it? I'm trying to get a track on it now. They sent link 16. But my radar picture is clean. The next radio call takes everyone by surprise. Fast Eagle 110, say loadout. 110, what's your weapons loadout? Yeah, the tactical action officer, the TAO, um, jumps on the radio. Her name was Lieutenant Elders, and she just point blank asked the Fast Eagle flight if they were carrying any type of weapons. And fast, there was a stunned pause on the radio. Wings clean, Princeton. We just have CAD-M training missiles, and they're not coming off the rail. We're in an exercise environment, and the last thing we wanted to do is start shooting stuff. Now the controllers have the pilots' undivided attention. Normally, the squadron doesn't carry live ordnance when training. What do you guys think that was about? What, about the loadout? I have no idea. Maybe it's drug runners or something. Yeah, it could be. Or a lost session out of SoCal. I don't like this. Fast Eagle Charlie, contact Bra 16034, 8,000 feet, love you. Roger, 34 miles at 8,000. Committed, your call, continuing. As Fast Eagle approaches the target, they see nothing unusual. Their onboard radars can't get a lock on the object. Fast Eagle Charlie, Bra 16010, 8,000 feet. Roger. Fast Eagle Charlie, merge plot. Basically, what the merge plot means on the radar, you got two objects in the same vertical piece of sky, so when I'm looking at the 2D display, it looks like a one, one radar blob now. The object appears stationary. I had it at 177. So I get yeah, basically no airspeed on it. Hey, you guys seeing us? What is that? As the Super Hornets approach the target, they see a disturbance on the ocean surface. It's about the size of a 737, and it looks like something could be just below the surface. Zero, zero, 
observing something in the water here, possibly aircraft in the water at the merge plot, just north of our position, about two miles. Charlie, roger. I'm descending to Angels 14 to take a look. Do you think that's our unknown? Nah, not sure. Radar is clean. As soon as he got to the merge plot position, the object that he was intercepting dropped from 28,000 feet down to 50 feet above the water in 0.78 seconds, as I found out later the next day. As the Super Hornets get closer to the ocean disturbance, he suddenly spots another craft above it, a much smaller white object with an oblong shape, hovering, then darting just above the waves. The object is moving around erratically, seemingly focused on the white water. The shape is similar to a tic-tac. It's smooth like porcelain. It's not an airplane. 